Hey everyone, Johnny here and welcome to another video. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you're notified of all of our latest videos. But let's get into this video. We're going to be looking at bearings and I'm going to be taking you through a couple of simple examples here of how to work out a bearings question. So we'll be using points A and B, P and Q, and in other videos I will go into more difficult examples. But today I really want to get into the principles. I want to give you some tricks to help you solve any bearings question that resembles these kind of situations. I want to make that easy for you to understand and I'm going to start by giving you a helpful acronym, a little trick to help you remember the fundamental things that you should be doing for every bearings question, no matter what, if it's easy or if it's really difficult. Okay, so what do I use? I use the three D's, okay? I use the three D's, triple D if you like, or 3D, okay? You can remember that. When you do a bearings question, think of the three D's, okay? And this is what you want to do for every bearings question, or at least it's what I do. The first D, okay, represents diagram. We want to have a diagram to represent the information. This almost goes without saying, but there are still people out there who would look at a question like this where they didn't already provide you a diagram and you wouldn't actually draw one in yourself. So you need to draw a diagram so you can visually see what's going on. This is so important for bearings. You also want to make sure that that diagram is a big diagram. Okay, so don't draw a small diagram even if the numbers in the question are small. You need to exaggerate the information on the diagram so that you can clearly see what's going on and so that you aren't confusing numbers for other numbers in the diagram and so that angles aren't being smudged in and are barely visible to you. So big diagrams, no matter the information, and exaggerate the length, exaggerate the size of the angles so that you can clearly see what's going on. But that is an absolute must. The second D is for directions. Now directions I mean to draw in the directions of north, south, east, and west at every point on the diagram. So you can see here, I drew in a rough diagram to represent this information, A and B. You can see it's nice and big. That's the first D. But the next thing I'll do is I will insert a north, south, east, and west line at every point. So we want to emphasize, I should say, with that diagram, we want to emphasize the actual starting point and the ending point, okay, and obviously you draw a line in between, but then what you want to have, and I'll show it here in red, is you want to clearly have your north, south, east and west lines like that. That's going to be important because that's going to allow you to create some angles here and then see some relationships later on using the parallel lines that will be formed between the north, south and east, west lines, okay? So make sure you do those Again, always doing them big enough. Don't try and cram anything on your page. If you find in a question that all of the information is looking very small because you have crammed it onto a small diagram, it is worth just redoing the diagram and just drawing it bigger because you will see things in a lot clearer way. Okay, so directions, you do that at every point. That doesn't mean you just do it at the first point. So where I'm dealing with point A here, Okay, I draw the north, south, east, west. I can do a north here. But I also need to do it at B. You do it at every single point that is involved in the question. And that's really important. Okay, so again, I will draw in another set of directions here for north, south, east, west. Okay, and I can just fill the north in to show you that there. That is important again because what we're really doing here is we're creating a situation where we have some parallel lines involved in the question. As you can see here, that north-south north south line, that helps us create a relationship to then fill in information later. So, always do that for every single point involved in the question. The last D is for detail, okay? And that means fill in as much detail as you can in the diagram using the information from the question, okay? So, even where they give you one particular number here, such as 30 degrees, that's the only number in this question, I will use that to fill in other numbers in the diagram. And you're going to see that in a second. So the more you can just from the outset fill in the diagram, even with information that might not even be used to get to the answer, 
It just puts you in a position where you are ready to answer any question that comes at you. So I always just make a habit of doing that because it tends to make things easier, especially with the harder questions where there are more steps involved. Okay, so just get used to taking the information they give you and then using that to fill in as much information as possible, fill in the detail. Okay, so they're the three D's that you should remember for any bearing question. Okay, with, let's do these two examples and implement that. So here it says, B is on a bearing of 30 degrees from A. Find the bearing of A from B. Now, many people would see this and they would straight away think the answer is 30 degrees and they wouldn't have even drawn a diagram. But what you need to see here is that the initial statement says that B is on a bearing of 30 degrees from A. So I need you guys to know that from is the most important word really in a question because it's all about where we're looking from when we're thinking about a bearing, when we're thinking about the angle that you have to turn to look in a particular direction. That's what a bearing is. So if it says B, which is over here, is on a bearing of 30 degrees from A, it means that A is my starting point. So A is my starting point and then it says B is on a 30 degree bearing. Okay, so A is the starting point at the moment when I'm filling in this information from A and now I need to fill it in because remember detail and diagram, okay, I need to fill it in. When it says it's on a bearing of 30 degrees, what it means is it's on a bearing of 30 degrees from the north direction and that's again why you always fill in the north, south, east, west lines. So in this on this north line here, we always move clockwise when it presents a question like this. We move clockwise, so that's going to the right from that north uh, branch or arm there. And we fill that in with 30 degrees in this case, okay? Because it's only 30 degrees. If it was more than 90 degrees, and you should note that if you're going east, that's 90 degrees. If you're going south, that's 180 degrees. And if you're going west, that is 270 degrees. It's useful to memorize those. And if you went all the way around, it would be 360 degrees, of course. And also when you start, it's zero degrees. So north is both zero degrees and 360 because 360 is a full revolution. It would be going around full circle, okay? And 180, you know, when you do a 180, you are spinning around to face the opposite direction. Okay, so you should know that. And from there, we fill in the 30 degree angle here. And now we want to use the fact that we have parallel lines. This is before I even read this, the actual question, what we want to find. I would just straight away use this information to fill in the diagram as much as possible. Remember, we need to do detail. So 30 degrees is here. I know that this quadrant, we call this a quadrant, right? This kind of square here is 90 degrees because all of these are 90 degrees. That's what how we separate north, east, south, and west, okay, through these, rect these square boxes, and they all represent 90 degrees. So because it's 90 degrees, I know straight away that this part is 60 degrees. You can see that here. It's 60 degrees because 30 plus 60 makes 90, and that's, again, why we use these north, south, east, west lines to help us add more information that could be useful. What we can then do is use the fact that we have parallel lines here. See how these lines here, this line here and this line here are parallel because they are both facing north. And when you have parallel lines, you can use certain relationships to help you find other angles. And what I mean by that is you can use something called alternate angles. I'll just do that in a better color for you. So you can use alternate angles. You could use co-interior angles and you could use corresponding angles. We'll have another video exploring these in more detail, but you want to look for these three relationships in the diagram. And typically, it's just going to be the first two, mainly just the first one, alternate angles that are relevant. But whenever you have parallel lines, you need to think about those three situations. So parallel lines, you think about, oh, are there alternate angles? Are there co-interior angles? Are there possibly corresponding angles? Okay. So that's for parallel line situations, which will always happen in bearings because you're going to be drawing those north-south lines and those east-west lines at every point. So you're automatically creating a parallel line situation. Now, how do you know what is an alternate angle? Well, 
if you already know these three or if you go and watch our other video, you'll find that an alternate angle, right, is an angle that kind of creates a Z shape with another angle on the other side of this line here. So we've got the two parallel lines here. And you can see that there's almost a Z shape. If you look at this, there is a Z shape. And that is an indicator for an alternate angle. The co-interior is given more by a C and the corresponding will look more like an F. So you can see here a Z shape where I've kind of outlined the green there. Okay, And because there's a Z shape, we know we have alternate angles, which means that they are equal. So alternate angles are equal, whereas co-interior angles add up to 180 degrees. Okay, so that's 30 degrees, therefore that is 30 degrees. All right, so we've used the fact that there are parallel lines. There are alternate angles here because we can see a Z shape. Again, alternate angles, that means the angles are equal. So I can write in 30. And by the same token, or yes, by the same token here, I can actually say that because I found out that this was 60 degrees, because I knew that these two had to add to 90, I can see another Z emerging. Can you see the other Z? It's this Z. If you can see where I'm tracing with my texture here, there is a Z there. And again, if there's a Z there on parallel lines, right? In this case, the parallel lines, I should say, are these horizontals. These horizontal lines are the parallel lines. We don't have to use the north, the vertical north-south line. And we can actually fill that in with 60 degrees. Okay, great. So that's what I mean by filling in the diagram as much as possible. Now I look at the question, find the bearing of A from B. Now this says to do it from B. So your answer is not 30 degrees because that was the bearing from A. Now the starting point is B. So I start here, my eyes start here. And then I have to ask myself, what angle from this north branch, what angle from that north branch just here is going to be needed to get me back to this line that would take me towards A? But the angle has to start at this north side. So I always just do a little dot somewhere on that north line there. And then you just draw a circle all the way around until we hit this particular line here, which will take us towards A. So that's how you find the bearing of B from A. Obviously, to then get the actual answer, you want to find out what is the total angle. And what you use is if the angle goes past this 90 degree mark, well, you know you've already gone 90 degrees. If it goes past the south point here, so if it goes more than 180, you know you currently have 180. And then what you do is you see which quadrant the line falls in. So the line falls in the quadrant, that is this section here, this square box here, okay? Which means I can just get the 180 degree angle straight away because I know that if I turn all the way to south, I've gone 180 and then you can figure out using these angles that you filled in how much more you need to go to get to a point where you're facing point A. So you go 180 degrees plus 30, that takes you to 210. So we end up here with 180 degrees because that was as far as we could go in terms of those 90 degree blocks. And then we added 30 degrees, which we got from that information there to get 210 degrees. So that is the bearing of A from B. And because this is what we call a true bearing, you just do a capital T at the end, okay? It just means it's a true bearing, which means that it is the angle all the way from the north facing direction, okay? So because we've come all the way from that north line, it's called a true bearing. Whenever you move clockwise and then give the angle that results from that movement, that is a true bearing and you do a capital T. Another way of writing the answer using more of a compass bearing, sometimes a question will want you to do that, is where you take whatever is most relevant, the north or south. Well, here, clearly the angle and the line here is more on the south side of this point B. Okay, so because we're on more of the south side, you can see that if I drew that line there, the line is south of that line. It's not going north of that line anywhere. So we could also write that the angle equals south. And then how many, what degree do we turn from south to get to the line? Well, we have to turn 30 degrees in what direction? West, because this is west over here. Okay, so we go south 30 degrees west. Again, if the line was 30 degrees this way, then I would have written south 30 degrees east and I would have done E, okay? 
But usually your answer is in true bearing. That's how you work that out. Okay, how do you do this example? Q is on a bearing of 135 degrees from P. I'm going to do this a lot quicker. So Q is on a bearing of 135 degrees from P. So we start we start at P. What do I do? I put the dot in and I do my north, south, east, west lines. And then I know that we're going to end at Q, right? I know we're going to end at Q. So I do my north, south, east, west lines there. I knew roughly that Q was going to be in this direction by looking at the 135. That's why I drew Q down here. But I don't know exactly where it is. I'm going to fill that in. But I had a rough idea because it said 135. I knew that from the north direction, I have to go beyond this 90 degree mark. Because if I went east, east, which is here, that would be 90 degrees. But it goes 135. But it doesn't go enough to go beyond the 180. So that's how I knew it was roughly in this direction. So it's good to think about that before you draw the diagram. Okay, so here we have a situation where this is 135. I know that that's 90 because I know that in total it's 135, but I only ever want to deal with the acute angles. So instead of keeping 135, I'm going to break that up into two parts. I know that this is 90. 90 plus what equals 135? You can just do 135 minus 90. That is 45 degrees. So again, we're filling in the diagram with as much detail as possible, and we would rather have these smaller acute angles than keep that angle as 135, right? I'm using the 135 to get me to this 45 here. Once I have the 45 angle degree here, I then can use the fact that we have a Z. Again, we have that Z. Alternate angles. Have a look at that Z relationship. That means that this angle here on the opposite side of this line that separates them, which is called a transversal, but you don't need to worry about that. That is 45 degrees. That is 45 degrees. Okay, that is going to be helpful. If I know that that's 45 degrees, and I know that this quadrant should add up to 90 because all of these are in 90 degree portions, then this should also be 45 degrees. And I also know by the same token that this should also be 45 degrees. So again, filling in the diagram with as much as possible. Now we need to find the bearing of P from Q. So I start at Q. I start here and then I do my north. And now I draw in the line. Remember, I have to go all the way from north clockwise. Don't go the wrong way. I go all the way around until I get back to the line that helps me face to P. Okay, so how far have we gone here? Well, again, we've gone past the 90 degree. We've gone past the 180. We've even gone past the 270 because, again, that's three lots of 90s. We've gone past those three quadrants. But then we land here. So what I do is I just get the 270 that I know is this west line. And then I add the 45 that we filled in. So the answer is going to be 270 degrees plus 45 degrees, which is going to be 315 degrees true. Okay, remember we do the T when we do a true bearing coming from north. Another way we could have done that is to start backwards and say, hey, if we went all the way around, it would have been 360 degrees. And then we can take away the 45 degree angle that you can see on that side. And that would also get us to 315. And remember, the way of doing that as a compass bearing is it more on the north side or the south side? It's more on the north half. Remember, there's our dividing line. So now this is going more the north direction. So I would write north. Then I would say, okay, if I'm north, how far do I have to turn to get to the line? Well, I have to turn 45 degrees west. So if I start at north, I turn 45 in the west direction, not the east direction. So that would be the compass bearing but as I said, more common to do the true bearing. Okay, there's two examples. Remember the three Ds. Good luck with your bearings question and I'll see you in the next video.